How many of you have been saved? How many of you have been saved? All right. That's that, last, that last song is about thank, Let's give thanks to the Lord for that, shall we? Father, I thank you that you have saved us. If we trust in you, you have saved us today. We're washed, our sins are washed away, and we are clean, and we can stand in front of you clean and right. Thank you for that. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your love for us. And I pray as we open your word this morning, teach us. Teach us from your word. We're going to talk about baptism. And so give me the uh, ability to, uh, first of all, as I put your word in front of us, speak to our own hearts. Give me the ability to communicate well, um, clarity of thought, and to be accurate to your word too, Father, what you desire. So I ask for that this morning too. Bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Second question. How many of you have been baptized before? Whether it's baptism as an adult or as an infant, how many of you, most of you been baptized? Some of you haven't? You know, at Clover here, uh, we were at one of our board meetings, and we were talking about that a little bit. Um, we talked about membership classes, and I said, you know, what about baptism? Because uh, I think we have a lot of times uh, kind of played down baptism and so we were talking a little bit about it do we have Arnie do we have that list of questions up there put that up I'm going to throw some questions up on the board and I'm not I thought about just taking one question at a time and working through it um, and instead my pattern of teaching today will just go down through scriptures what scripture says um, one situation after the next that's how we're going to handle this well I'll put the questions in front of you and you from what you know, try to answer them. Okay, ba um, let's just go with that. What is the meaning of baptism? Okay, that's the first question. What's that? We're getting there. Good job, George. Who should get baptized? And who should not? Yeah, you know, let's not answer these out loud, okay? Uh, we're going to have a few minutes here, about 30 minutes or something here. We're going to work on that. Um, and I might not get these all answered completely, but this is these are questions for you to think about. Can you answer these questions? Who should get baptized? And are there people that should not get baptized? Just thought about that. Are there people that should, be, that should not be baptized? Does baptism, baptism save me? Mom, you're not supposed to answer the question. So. <laughs> Okay? <laughs> Is baptism required for salvation? What happens if you don't get that? So maybe you come to a point in your life where you trusted the Lord Jesus, you asked him to come to your sins, and then you didn't get baptized. Does that like are you kind of like crossed off the list because you didn't get baptized? Is there a right way to get baptized? Now some people will sprinkle, or some churches will sprinkle. Some will dunk you. Um, and I know an adult that was, uh, it was actually a person that was, um, I think it was like probably the time of COVID that had gotten saved, wanted to get baptized, but they could not put this person, I don't even remember who it was, but they couldn't put them under the water. They said, uh, can you sprinkle me? So does that count? For those of you that are dunkers? <laughs> Should babies be baptized? From Luther and Catherine, uh, Catholic back, background, should you be baptizing babies? And if you're uncomfortable with that, you know, I'm going to leave that one pretty much open. We'll talk a little bit. Maybe at the end, I think we got time. We'll see how that goes. Where should you get baptized? For you folks at Kathy Daniel, there's been a lot of Clover people that have gotten baptized over there at the lake. Okay? And who should go to your baptism? You ever thought about that? Interesting thought because I didn't. That was a, oh, I was 15, 20 years ago. My age, I would say. Yeah. Anyway, um, and I had never thought about that. They encouraged me. They had. I think they even had like invites, so they would hand out invites to you could. They give if you were getting baptized, they give you a stack of invites, and you could hand them out to people for you to invite to the baptism. So who should go to your baptism? And that was my list of questions. I don't know that I'll answer all of them. If you want one of them particular answered by me, you can catch me at the door. What we're going to do is go back 
and read from Scripture just kind of what we know of baptism there. Try to uh, let the Scripture answer a lot of these questions, okay? Who was, actually flip over to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, okay? Who was the guy in the Bible that was known for baptizing? John the Baptist. You do not have Matthew the Baptist. You do not have Peter the Baptist. Um, you do not have Bartholomew the Baptist. You have John the Baptist. And who was John? And we're going to read about that a little bit in chapter 3 of Matthew. It says, In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert of Judea, saying, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice, and this is a quote from Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey, and people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptizing, excuse me, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Where did, where did John the Baptist come from? What do we know about his parents when he was born? Right on. Deb, you get a star. Okay. <laughs> If you remember, that was at the, we read that at the Christmas story, right? Um, John's parents wanted to have children, could never have children. Finally, when his dad uh, was, he got drawn for the high priest's duty to go into the, before the, I think it was in the Holy of Holies there, and he was in there, and an angel showed up and said, you're going to have a son, you're going to name him John. And he says the Spirit of God was going to be on John from the time he was just a baby and if you remember when elizabeth his mother actually it was mary the mother of jesus came to elizabeth's house they were both two pregnant ladies get together and remember when mary i think she knocked on the door called out remember that i'm kind of going from what i remember here and what happened in elizabeth's stomach in her womb the baby jumped he kicked I think we talked about that this last Christmas. You know, my mother, when she, we, I'm the second of seven kids, so I was there for the young mom being pregnant for the younger, one, younger ones, and mom would say, here, the baby's kicking. Put your hand on my stomach, and we could feel the baby kick. So when Jesus comes, Mary, with Jesus in her womb, comes to the door, what happens? John the Baptist, the Spirit of God is already on him as an infant, and he Woof, you know, he gives a kick and let mom know that something extraordinary is going on, that Jesus has just arrived. Okay? And so the Spirit of God came on John. And the thing is, if parents were old, what happened? John probably, and we doesn't tell us really the history of John, how things went in his life, but probably when he was fairly young, maybe he was 12, maybe he was a teenager, um, his parents probably passed on. We don't know where he went, but the thought is that he probably went to the desert to some, I don't know what the sect was that was out there that were just giving themselves to the Lord. What we do know, as John became an adult, what kind of life did he live? Did he drive fast cars, get a well-paying job? What did he wear? A coat of camel's hair. Okay? He's supposed to be of the high priestly line, or the priestly line, right? And that was kind of taboo. But it's, I was, one of the notes I read, read says that when you were not in the temple, you could actually wear that. So he wore camel's hair and a leather belt. Kind of a rough man. He was a Nazarite too, so he probably looked like a hippies or um, someone from Duck Dynasty might be for today's generation, okay? Um, that was John the Baptist. What did he have for lunch? What did he eat? <laughs> you know, if you came through, we've had people over for a house for a Sunday lunch. Can you imagine Julie coming out? And we sit down, and we give thanks for the food, and Julie sets the food in front of you. It's locust, in other words, grasshoppers, and wild honey. I could handle the wild honey, but I'm passing on the locusts. But locusts were a clean food. They were allowed to eat them as a Jew. 
But the point is that John gave his life to serving the Lord. He was sold out. He didn't chase after the frills of life. And he was um, basically the grasshoppers, which was what he could gather around him. Grasshoppers, maybe he could find some honey once in a while. But he gave himself to preaching the word of God. And what was his message to the people? Repent. Let's go back and look at that. Repent, and that's in verse, uh, it's right, right in the beginning, of, right, right in verse 2, it says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. Prophet of Isaiah said, before the Lord Jesus comes, there's going to be a man named, well, it doesn't say his name, John, but a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way the Lord makes straight paths for him. So John went out to the people of Israel, and he said, you need to straighten up. You need to get your life together. Because the kingdom of the Lord is at hand. The Lord is coming. Um, and it's interesting that what he asked of the people, or when they got baptized, they would become convicted of the sin in their life. They would hear, I don't know what he, what he taught, if he read the law. It doesn't say really what all his message was, but he would speak. And people would come. They would say, I, they, they were, it was actually the Holy Spirit moving on them. They were concerned for where they, how they were living and they would step forward and they would confess their sins and then John would take them down to the water and he would baptize them. As I understand it, and I'm not here to be a real strong advocate of submersion as opposed to sprinkling, but they said he, they, he went to a place where there was a lot of water and that's where he would, he would, they would put them down in some water, lift them back up, and they would, and people. It was there was a there was people on the banks that would see these people as they confessed their sins, and they would get baptized. It, the neighbors were watching, and they would realize this person is serious about following the Lord. They're going to change, and that's what happened there. We got to go forward just a little bit more. Um, let me read just a little bit about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These were the religious people. It says, but when he verse seven, but when he saw many of the Pharisees. And the Sadducees, that's kind of the spiritual, like the upper echelon. When they were coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produ produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And so he kind of came down pretty hard on the religious people. He says, just because you're religious doesn't mean you're right with God. He says, get your life together. Get rid of the things that are wrong in your life. Repent. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. Who's he talking about? Who's this other one that's going to follow after him? Jesus. John baptized for repentance. What was Jesus going to bring? The Holy Spirit when he came. says he will baptize you with the holy spirit and with fire his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear the threshing floor gathering his wheat into the barn burning up the chaff with uncrenchable fire i'm going to move on just a little bit there it says then jesus came from valley to the jordan to be baptized by john okay now picture this because we know as you read on we're going to find out jesus gets baptized there but play that out in your mind just a little bit i'm going to i'm going to i, I kind of got to see these things in my mind so john's preaching on the banks of the river right People are coming forward. Um, as people get convicted, there's a, maybe a man who comes up and he starts confessing his sins, right? Um, he says, you know, I've been a liar. I've been immoral. He says what he has done. And he says, I'm sorry for that. And then John takes him down to the river and baptizes him. So maybe it's a lady who comes up and she lists some things she's done. And then steps forward Jesus. And there's kind of a silence, right? Jesus, uh, do you have anything you want to confess? <laughs> Jesus didn't have anything to confess either, right? Why did Jesus get baptized? See, baptism is a form of dying to yourself. Did Jesus need to die to himself? Right on. That's a part of baptism, is dying to yourself. 
You turn away from your sins and you die to yourself. To Jesus, and they, and they, we know what was going to happen in Jesus' life in the days to come, right? Not only the normal testings and trials of life, but he was going to face the cross. And Jesus had to die to himself. And John, and usually it's, the, it's like the spiritual elder, the spiritual father that does the baptizing. So here's John. He's standing on the banks of the river. Jesus comes forward, and he knows who Jesus is. God, God's revealed this to him. This is the Messiah. And he's like, wait a minute. Jesus, you should be baptized in me. And, uh, and, uh, and Jesus says, no. Let me just read that verses there so we get it right. He says, verse 15, Jesus said, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to, reveal, to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. So Jesus says, to fulfill all righteousness, I need to be baptized. And so Jesus, and that's my take on it. Okay? I'm, I'm throwing this in my, my own thought on this. Jesus had to die to himself. It doesn't say that in scripture, but why would Jesus, because Jesus does not have any sins to repent of, to turn from, right? But he does need to die to himself, and that's my own take on that passage if you disagree with me see me afterwards and straighten me out okay but that is a part of you're, you're repenting of your sins you're dying to yourself okay as soon as jesus was baptized he went up from the out of the water and at that moment heaven was open and he saw the spirit of god descending like a dove and lighting or landing on him and a voice from heaven said this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. And at Jesus, this point in Jesus' life, what happened? At this is the point in Jesus' life where he, known to be, a, from what scripture indicates, he was probably like a carpenter or stonemason. This is the point that he put that aside and went full-time service for the Lord. It's also the point that he began to minister to people. And so it was this changeover even in Jesus' life, the switch where he went full-time ministry so that's what we have in john the baptist that's where it started out if you go forward then to john the chapter uh, the book of john and i'm going to just move you through some passages i'm going to do try to do fairly quickly john chapter four first three verses there and now jesus starts to minister right what's it is john is still going and doing his thing and we run across an interesting uh, kind of commentary on what's going on there it says the pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. And when the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. So what you got going, you got John, he probably hangs out over by the Jordan River. Jesus is someplace also in that area. And as pe Jesus begins to preach too, people would get convicted of their sin and what happened with the Jesus preached. They would get bad. The people that got con convicted, they would go forward, and they also would get baptized. Who did the baptizing, though? Interesting. It wasn't Jesus that necessarily did the baptizing. It was the disciples that did the baptizing. And there's one more commentary that that verse 3 there says, when people start to realize, hey, more people are getting, are repenting because of Jesus' ministry and getting baptized, it says Jesus heard that, and he moved away. It's like he said, I'm not going to compete with John. It's, that's my take on it, okay? Jesus moved when he heard that. He went to a different region. And so at the same time, you have John over here preaching, baptizing. You have Jesus preaching and his disciples baptizing another. And so I don't know that there's necessarily a switch, but that pattern continues. You repent, you confess your sins, and you get baptized. Go to the end of Matthew. We before fast forward through the life of Jesus to the cross, and then his resurrection from the grave. Matthew, that is 28. I, sh I used to know this one, but I don't trust my memory anymore. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Jesus is ready to go back to heaven, and it says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So what did Jesus tell the disciples to do before he left? Did you catch that? What were they supposed to do? He said, make disciples. He said, make disciples. Teach them to obey my commands. And he said, baptize them. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Do you guys baptize at, at, at uh, Camp Nathaniel? No. Uh, you know, I, I was, grew up in, like, in, in Grindstone Lake out on the side of Hinckley, uh, the Bible camp there. And they never... You know, people would get saved. We'd ask campers or whatever, to, to, you know, if they want to be saved or if they want to turn to the Lord or call on the Lord. And there were a lot of times there were campers who made a decision for the Lord. But we kind of left baptism out of it. And this last summer I went uh, with Camp Evergreen. It was, at, I forget the name of the place, up by north by towards, to, to, on the way up to Duluth there. And the, the speaker there, he said, I want to be true to the word. I asked about, and it was a senior high week, okay? High school kid, junior high, probably like 15 to 18. And there were some kids that wanted to get baptized. He said, this is how we're going to handle it. He said, if you want to get baptized, come and talk to me. And they would kind of check out, you know, what did they believe? And he said, and then we'll call your parents because we want to get your parents' permission because they want to be respectful of the parents. Did. But they didn't have a, a baptismal service then on the last day. But that is what Jesus told the disciples to do. He says, when, you, when a person gets saved, to get baptized. Again, I come back to where we have been as a church at Clover, so many times we call on people to, um, to turn to the Lord, to re, you know, confess their, their sins and call on the Lord Jesus to forgive them, um, and to believe in the Lord. But we don't really put forth the baptisms too much. But that is something that Jesus taught. And we discussed that again, and I'm and now shooting a little bit off the cuff. We talked about that at our board meeting. He says, is that important? Is it, is it necessary? Do, let me ask you this. Do you need to be baptized to go to heaven? No. The baptism is a confession of your faith. It's an outward sign of what's happened inside. Um, I'm going to move you just forward a little bit. I'm starting to get ahead of the game a little bit. I'm going to bring you forward to Acts chapter 2, 36. If you would go there with me, if you can find that a little bit. And then, well, this is actually, we mentioned the day of Pentecost, Kathy. Okay, we're on the day of Pentecost here. And the disciples have been waiting for the Holy Spirit. They've been, um, and I can't tell from this passage, it sounds like they were at a house. And then it also says that they spent almost all their time at the temple. So I don't know where it's actually happening at, but they are on the day of Pentecost. It's fairly early in the day yet. It's about 9 o'clock in the morning, maybe a little before 9 even when this happens. And they're gathered together, and all of a sudden there's a sound of rushing wind and um, the Holy Spirit comes on them and shows like flames of fire. Um, and they begin to speak. They speak in tongues. And the people that are around, regardless of which country you were from, whether you were from like Greece, whether you were from um, Parthenia was one other, another one, as mentions a bunch of those countries, whatever your, language, your native tongue was, you could hear them, even if they were, whatever, uh, they were speaking normally, and you could understand them whatever whatever dialect or uh, language you had and there's because they're kind of wondering what's going on here and peter picks that up and he says and i'm just going to go forward with that he begins to explain the lord jesus and it says in verse 38 it says and peter replied repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the holy spirit the promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord, our God, will call. And so there again, Peter commands, he says, you know what, folks? You need to repent and be baptized. Now I'm going to ask you a question. What did it mean if you were Jewish at that time and you got baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? What did that mean? See, if you were Jewish and your folks were devout Orthodox Jews, what did they think about Jesus? Yeah, they did not. In fact, some of the people there at that time were probably people who had been there at the crucifixion of Jesus. And so Peter's telling them, if you guys want to be right with the Lord, you need to repent, you need to confess your sins and turn to Jesus 
get baptized in Jesus' name. And so they had to make a decision. Did they want to identify with Jesus? And that's another aspect of baptism. When you get baptized, you identify with Jesus. Jesus is my Savior. And so I just want to emphasize that point. That is a picture of what happens. Roman talks a little in... Um, there's one more I'll bring you to. Romans, Romans chapter 6. Maybe I'll talk more on this one than I... Oh yeah, I will read it. Romans chapter 6 to kind of pick up that point a little bit. To give you some background so as I read this you understand it. The, this book, the book of Romans, is written to the Roman Christians, okay? The missionaries or whoever had come to the people of Rome, they explained the Lord Jesus, how he died for sins, um, and there were people that got saved. People turned to the Lord. What did it happen when they got saved? They got baptized. That's what happened. Okay? Now they're at a point. They've been Christians. And sometimes the pull of the world came to them. And so they would be inclined to go back to their old sins. And Paul's addressing that to the Roman Christians. He says, uh, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? He says, in other words, their thought was, you know what? All right, so I'm a Christian. If I sin, I just ask the Lord for forgiveness. His blood covers it, and I can sin, forget it forgiven, and I can go on, and I'm right, right? And what did Paul say about that? Absolutely not. You can't do that. He says, by no means. We died to sin. How can we live any longer in it? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. What happened at the cross? God takes all the sin of the world and puts it on Jesus. In other words, like our sins were all crucified with Jesus. They were laid on him, tied to the cross, and then buried. And that's where sin gets left. Okay, And then Jesus rises to a new life, a new, new spiritual body. And he says, when you get baptized, that's a picture of what happens to us. We take all our sins, the junk we got in our life, we nail it to the cross, it goes to the grave, and we leave it there. And so when you take a person, and again, I'm talking submersion, when you put them down into the water, it's a picture of them dying to their sin. And then they get raised to a new life. And so here are these Romans that are inclined to go back to their sin. And Paul's saying, wait a minute. Remember when you got baptized? What happened? You were supposed to die to your sin. That's what baptism is about. You know, I go to the jail once in a while. I've actually, uh, I know Roy uh, Maori was supposed to be coming back this summer, so I bowed out for the summer. But uh, it was a few weeks, probably about a half a dozen weeks back there, and there was a group of guys, and it was interesting because these were, there was maybe one guy that had a church background. Um, the other four really hadn't had a lot. But they had started reading the scriptures, and I could tell as I asked questions and we, we interact, I kind of want to find out, before I even start teaching, kind of find out what they know, what their beliefs are. And these guys had come to a point where they had started to believe in the Lord Jesus. And after a week or two, I talked to him or whatever. I said, you know what? You guys are at a point in your life that you are ready for baptism. Some of them had come out of drugs. or Well, they came to jail because they were of their drugs, right? Now they have believed in the Lord Jesus. They realize Christ died for sins. And they're getting ready. And some of the guys would be there for a couple, some are there for a few days, a week. Some are there for a few months. But as they get ready to go back home, I said, you know what you need to do? You need to get baptized. You need to get together. You need to get someone. And I, said, and I offered myself from the, the group that goes down there. I said, um, you need to go back to your families and you need to take a stand. You need to get baptized because that's a, a sign to the people around you that you have quit your old ways and that now you are going to follow the Lord and live for him. 
And that's what baptism's about. So again, I come back to you. Do you have to be baptized to be saved? What I read in Scripture says no, that you do not have to. We know the thief on the cross never got baptized. Zacchaeus is another one we talked about a little bit at our meeting the other day. Zacchaeus was one of those guys. Um, he came down out of the tree. Jesus went to his house, and he says, you know what? He started telling about the, how he was going to turn from his sin, and Jesus, he never got baptized. And Jesus said, salvation has come to this house today. So my understanding is, no, you do not have to be baptized to be saved, but it's confession of what the Lord has done for you. It is also a point in your life where you look back to and you say, here's where I died to myself, and I have committed myself to living for the Lord. So I would confer, can, you know, put it in front of you folks if you've never been baptized. Your salvation is good, but it is a, it is a statement to the people around you that Christ has saved you from your sins, who you are going to be. I'm going to live for the Lord. And I would encourage you to be baptized, whether here, whether at Camp Nathaniel, with the group over there, if you have a home church or family. I, interesting, I'll go back. There was one other thing I throw about the invites. And I don't remember who it was or where it was I heard that, but the point was that's a good opportunity um, to invite people around, people who are not saved. As a testimony, you say, you know what? God has saved me. Jesus, I believe in the Lord Jesus. He's covered my sins, and now I'm going to live for him. Invite those people to your baptism. And that's a witness, that's a testimony. It's also kind of like they hold you accountable because even if they're not Christians and they see you get baptized, when you go wrong way, what's going to happen? They're like, hey, I saw you get baptized. What are you doing that for? You know, it will, it will give you a nudge. So anyway, I put that in front of you today. I don't know, at some point we will probably look to have a baptismal service if someone would like to be baptized. Um, and so keep that in your minds. Um, talk to Howard, to myself, to Arnie. Talk to, talk to someone, I guess, that think you think knows something. And anyway. <clears throat> Father, I think uh, as we, uh, we just consider this a baptism, I, again, I come back to what the Lord Jesus has done for us. Our sins are nailed to the cross. They're buried, and we rise to a new life. And I think for those of us who have made that commitment, help us to live in, in a right way, to live right before you. I pray that our lives will be a testimony to the people around us. I pray for the world around us that doesn't know you, that are living in their sin that they need you to, and that you would bring them to a saving knowledge of you. I think in the week ahead, make us sensitive to the needs of people around us. Are those who are unsaved, who might need to turn to you or are looking to turn to you, help us to be sensitive to their needs. Lead us and guide us. I pray you bless the work of our hands. For those who might be students, Father, that you would... Um, Help them to do well in the days ahead, too. I think of the temptations we might encounter. Help us to live close to you, to put that stuff behind us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all you do for us. We love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, we pray these things.